So today we have a, a, normally our lineup is not this long, but we have a number of speakers this morning. Uh, I want to thank all of them for, for sparing the time. You have their bios, um, their details, so I, I will not uh, introduce them uh, in too much depth. Uh, but I want to thank um, Dr. Victor Ramrat for traveling from Canada uh, for, for this uh, forum. Uh, and uh, Suwilai. Uh, Prem Sirat uh, from Mahidol University, uh, Mr. Matt Wheeler uh, from the International Crisis Group, and Ajahn uh, Si Sompok from the Thailand's um, Deep South Watch, uh, based at uh, Prince of Songkhla University in Patani. We are missing Professor Chai Wasathanan, who is uh, stuck in traffic. He will be with us shortly. Um, today, what we want to do is we want to maintain attention on Thailand's southern Malay Muslim insurgency. We are very busy in Bangkok keeping up with our Prime Minister, uh, wondering if there's going to be a constitution, where it will be. We are wondering when the election will take place, if ever, how long um, this government will be around, and so on, and what kind of policies they will have. We are so obsessed. We are obsessed because we're stuck with them for some time. In the meantime, uh, the Malay Muslim insurgency in these three southernmost border provinces of Yala, Patani, and Ratiwat have remained um, virulent uh, and has claimed more than 6,500 lives. This is one of the deadliest, to be sure, one of the deadliest um, internal conflicts in the world. I mean, this, this ranks not far from uh, the Middle East, uh, places like Syria and so on. So it, it's something that we do not want to forget. We don't, we don't want to overlook. Um, so that's our main purpose here. That's the main purpose of ISIS, is to shed light, sustain light on the Malay Muslim insurgency. And then we want to also look at what can be done. What can be done? Uh, what the problems are, uh, where the solutions or the ways forward uh, lie. And this morning, the second purpose is to look at the role of language. Uh, in the Deep South. Uh, what can we do with language? Uh, the Malay Muslims, these are, these are Malay, et ethnic Malays who are Muslim, who happen to live in Thailand for a long time. They have their own language, apart from religion. So the title here is that, you know, language as a potential kind of peacemaker. Could that be the case? Is that a way of accommodating grievances, aspirations, frustrations of the Malay Muslims. Uh, we'll start with, with uh, our local experts, uh, Mr. Matt Wheeler of the International Crisis Group, and uh, Ajahn Sison Pop. I think we'll do with Ajahn Sison Pop first, Ajahn, because uh, Ajahn Sison Pop has collected meticulous data on everyday violence in the Deep South, everyday violence, so injuries, bombings, uh, fatalities, killings, and so on. So maybe, Dan uh, Pop, you can kick us off with uh, just some the latest numbers on the ground. We haven't heard, uh, we haven't had seminars on the Deep South for some time at, on campus uh, or in Bangkok. Uh, we have two very important uh, sets of remarks to begin with. First, I want to invite Mr. Michael Wiesner, uh, the resident representative to Thailand of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung to uh, provide a few remarks. Thank you very much. I don't want to take uh, too much time, but uh, also a very warm welcome on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Um, a very famous German philosopher, Friedrich Wilhelm von Humboldt, uh, once said, the true home is actually the language. It determines the longing and the displacement from the home always goes fastest by language. And uh, 
This quote shows uh, that language is a very important thing for the identity, for the identity of a person, also of a state. And um, in the 19th century, that was also very uh, important when the national states in Europe emerged. There were many criteria for national states, like a common culture, a common history, or commonly shared values but also the language, and uh, some European states have a common language, only one official common language, but there are also some states like, for example, Switzerland, which has uh, four or more than one official language. And um, another German philosopher said uh, also the language is like the body of thought and uh, so uh, language is not only a tool of communication it's uh, much more it's the visualization of thoughts and um, thoughts and language distinguish us uh, here uh, on this planet as uh, human beings and uh, therefore, language can be also a peacemaker in this conflict. And uh, therefore, I'm very glad that we as uh, Konrad Adenauer Foundation can uh, contribute today here in this uh, conference. And I'm very glad that uh, ISIS is a very long partner already of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, which has uh, or which had also in the past different uh, conferences. Uh, please uh, let me also say some words about us, about the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. We are a political foundation of Germany. We are closely associated to the Christian Democratic Party in Germany. We have 80 offices abroad around the world and projects in 120 countries. We are active here since uh, 35 years, and uh, we also implemented uh, some years ago a very big project in the Deep South, uh, which was co-funded by the European Commission. And um, yes, we, uh, we are our objective here in Thailand is to support the transformation process here in Thailand in ASEAN. Once again, many thanks to Professor Titinan and his team for organizing this uh, conference. Many thanks to our distinguished speakers today. And now I'm looking forward to the presentation, to the welcome remarks of uh, Mr. Ambassador and to uh, the presentations and discussions about the Deep South conflict. Thank you very much. Uh, Ajahn Titinan, uh, Mr. Windsor, distinguished guests, Sabika, bonjour, good morning. Uh, first of all, let me uh, reassure you, there's, there's a lot of papers here, but it's, the print is very big because my eyes are very weak, so this isn't going to be a long speech. But I did want to first of all thank uh, ISIS Thailand for putting this on, and of course the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for its uh, generous support of this event. Like all of us in the room, uh, we have, Canada has been following the Deep South conflict uh, quite closely over the years and we continue to express our hope for a peaceful solution. We have through the Canada Fund for uh, Local Initiatives, our embassy fund, supported uh, peace education in the South in the past. Uh, we will be this year also supporting uh, work on religious freedom in the Deep South uh, through the Patani Forum. But this event today provides uh, an opportunity to look uh, at uh, the issue from a somewhat slightly different angle. So we're very happy that we're addressing the issue of language and peacemaking today. You know, the language, languages we speak have a defining role in shaping how we view and express our identity, our culture, our nationality. And language can ha be, have a defining impact as a mechanism for empowerment and expression of our identity, or conversely, unfortunately, uh, as a way to silence groups and that society wishes to marginalize. So language policies can be extremely important. We in Canada have a long-standing history of language being used as, as a um, as a facet of identity, something that has once strengthened our national unity and at times uh, threatened to uh, undermine our national unity. So we hope this experience can be instructive here today in, as we discuss how language can support uh, peace efforts. Now, as has been mentioned, as many of you know, Canada is an officially bilingual country. 
Both English and French are enshrined as official languages, and this reflects our history as first a French and then a British colony. And the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is enshrined in our Constitution, contains several clauses which outline, outline language rights, uh, the preservation of language rights, and the right to receive services from the federal government in the official language of one's choice, whatever the population size uh, in the area, so, so wherever it warrants it. Uh, so um, since the, establish uh, the establishment of this policy, Canada's parliament and court system have been reinforced as bilingual institutions. This means being able to use either in French or English for federal government services, being able to be heard before federal courts in the official language of one's choice, having access to federal government publications in either language or following proceedings in the Supreme Court or Parliament in the official language of one's choice. These examples uh, reflect what we've learned from history. There are nation-building challenges we've had. Uh, while the majority of French-speaking Canadians live in the province of Quebec, there are also no uh, large numbers in Ontario, New Brunswick, Manitoba, other parts of Canada. And, and so the official languages policy was meant to address, at the time, a number of, uh, of uh, grievances, uh, of identity-based grievances on the part of the Canada's French-speaking minority. These, other, these grievances, had, grievances had been a source of, of tension within the country, uh, been a source of political instability, and, uh, and also had at times been part of a larger issue of, of that had led at times to uh, in the past to incidents of, uh, of violence as well. That, at that time, uh, French Canadians were underrepresented in the federal public service. They were treated inequitably by the federal administration. At the time that official bilingualism became a policy, 9% of the jobs in the Canadian federal public service were held by, uh, by francophones, even though francophones formed 25% of the Canadian population. So we, this was an attempt to address this, uh, this uh, inequity. So in this way, um, the protection of French and English-speaking minority rights became uh, not only part of our entrenched in our constitution, but served as a tool to support and maintain an inclusive and respectful society. In this way, language becomes a demonstration of how a country, its central government, and its citizens wish to respect and protect those with diverse identities and encourage them to feel invested in, in a unified concept of the country. Uh, so in thinking about the question of language and identity in Canada, many tend to focus on the English and French, issue of English and French, but actually the story goes beyond that and uh, demonstrates the value and the challenges of language as a tool for peace and the perils that come with failing to fully respect the value of language over the course of history. When you talk about the perils and the challenges and the mistakes Canada has made, we must first, we also must look at the situation with our First Nations people, our Indigenous peoples, and I'm delayed that Dr. Ramraj is here today who will be addressing some of this in his presentation. Uh, in, in their communities, there are communities of course all across Canada. Unlike French, the languages and cultures of Indigenous peoples did not enjoy the same level of historic protection and legal protections and promotion. In fact, in the last century and in the late uh, 19th century as well, we implemented policies of assimilation that in fact uh, enforced uh, uh, assimilation which had a tremendous damage, did tremendous damage to these communities. And we are still feeling the effects, the ramifications of this damage and these policies today. As a result, there are significant gaps between First Nations peoples and other Canadians in terms of understanding and support of cultural identity, although there are new uh, initiatives now to try to reinforce uh, First Nations education. The issue, though, this continues to be a, a major challenge in our governance uh, in Canada today, and it's something that uh, the new government uh, has, uh, has determined, said is determined to address uh, in the coming, and its coming mandate. So what this shows, of course, is that every country has these challenges, no, and no country has perfected the issue of language and identity. And the road to language and peace is neither direct nor easy. However, it does also reinforce the notion that language, identity, and culture are intricately, inter intricately, intricately intertwined. And only through respect for language and identity 
can one truly begin to build an inclusive and ultimately peaceful society. Finally, I'd like to mention another uh, issue that uh, Ajahn Titinan mentioned. In many ways, this represents the future of our, under, of our understanding in Canada of language identity and the foundation of a peaceful and inclusive society. The most recent Canadian census in 2011 shows that there are 6.6 .6 million Canadians, about 20%, whose first language is not English, not French, but Mandarin, Punjabi, Ukrainian, uh, many different languages. Uh, so this number is at the heart of our, our policy toward multiculturalism as we understand it today. In a country where one in five people first learn to speak a language that is neither English nor French, there is not surprisingly a clear emphasis on the role of language as a representation of identity for the passed down from grandparents or partners or brought over from their previous uh, homeland. In recognizing the link between language, identity, and an individual sense of belonging, our country has found that respect for language and culture becomes the foundation for inclusiveness, stability, and ultimately peace. So I'd like to make a couple of points tying this Canadian experience, both positive and negative, in this regard to the conflict in the Deep South. I think it is easy to dismiss the idea of the importance of language uh, by calling it a na naive approach to dealing with a seemingly intractable and often bloody conflict. That point of view, I think, ignores a fundamental point. An enduring peace cannot be achieved without inclusiveness, and inclusiveness cannot be achieved without respect for those around you. Respect in this sense requires the ability to understand and protect those attributes that people and communities hold dear. Few of these attributes has a greater impact than the language we speak. It is our way, it is our way, of, sharing, our way, sorry, it is our way of sharing our perspective, telling our history, and describing ourselves. The conflict in the Deep South will not be solved overnight. But language and the respect for identities linked to those languages can be an important, if not essential, first step. We can look to language then not as a source of division, but as a characteristic that must be fostered and respected in, ever, in efforts to create an inclusive and unified society for all populations in the country. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from today's speakers. I believe they will have very useful perspectives and practical recommendation, recommendations on the role that language and inclusiveness uh, can uh, promote respect, peace, and especially in the context of Thailand's Deep South. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, merci, Kapun Kap. Thank you. Today, in fact, we try to organize this uh, in Patani. Uh, in Patani, but uh, we couldn't do it for, for a number of uh, various reasons, logistical, organizational, but the idea would be to organize them like this in Patani. And if we do that, we would see that, you know, it, it really comes alive, the points that the ambassador mentioned about identities, about language. The first language with most people down in the Deep South, not Thai, not Central Thai, not what we would speak around here, but their own language, um, Yawi. Uh, let us now proceed to the uh, the panel. Uh, first, I would invite again uh, Dan Sison Pop. Uh, please tell us uh, is the violence getting worse, better, same? Uh, some of the latest numbers of uh, injuries, fatalities uh, from your database, Thailand's uh, Deep South Watch. Thank you. Um, so, I would like to uh, briefly introduce uh, the uh, current situation uh, from the Deep South Watch database and uh, Review the whole situation uh, concerning the language uses in, in the Deep South. Um, so this is the bilingual one. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, so my slide have two languages uh, because I have two uh, version of it. Um, the uh, recent uh, database of Deep South Watch. Uh, we have updated uh, the situation up until uh, actually until October uh, last month. Uh, but but in in this uh, in this uh, graphs uh, it uh, show up to uh, August. Uh, actually, it's uh, right now it's about uh, the, but the same level. I think the the pattern is still the same. Uh, that is, uh, we have overall incident of violence. Uh, from 2004 to uh, 2015, uh, around uh, 15, uh, 15, uh, uh, 16, about 15 or 16 
uh, thousands uh, incidents of violence uh, so far. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, over uh, 11 years, uh, we, we have been through difficulties. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, we, uh, in recent years, uh, the trend of violence has been stable, uh, has been stabilized uh, through different uh, approach of policy and uh, the movements on the crowd. Uh, and so you can see that the, the number of uh, the dead uh, from the violence in the Deep South is now so, uh, is about uh, 6,400 uh, uh, dead uh, and the uh, injuries uh, up to 11,000. Uh, so um, overall the casualties uh, is uh, more than uh, 10,000. So this is the uh, the consequence of the violence uh, uh, in the in the deep south. But uh, look at the uh, the variations of the uh, incident of violence in recent years. Uh, this is the monthly percent of monthly increase and decrease in the violence incidents. Uh, you can see that um, in recent year since uh, 2013, uh, it appeared that. Uh, the uh, the variance of the violence, that means the variation of the violence uh, month by month uh, have uh, increases. Uh, uh, that means uh, the uh, uh, sometime in recent years, uh, sometime uh, it looks like uh, the, it's quiet, you know, look like peaceful uh, situation, but uh, sometimes it looks like it's uh, escalated. Uh, so month by month, uh, uh, it is still unpredictable. Uh, so this is why uh, since 2013, we can see that you know, the percent of uh, monthly increase or decrease uh, has uh, uh, you know, varied you know, or in recent years. Uh, so this is a consequence of different factors. Uh, uh, one factor is the, uh, the movements uh, toward the, pre the peace uh, uh, the peace talk or peace dialogues uh, that result in uh, uh, stability of the local violence. Uh, but at the same time, the, uh, the, the, uh, the competing forces uh, in the peace process, uh, especially from the uh, BIN or from the uh, underground movements, uh, uh, have brought about the, you know, the variation of violence. Uh, sometimes some groups uh, disagree with the talks, uh, show up to, or express their, uh, you know, uh, concerns, uh, uh, sending messages uh, uh, on the ground in the violence situation. That uh, this is what we have seen, uh, you know, uh, in the last few, uh, you know, in a few days. In the, in the other days, that you know, uh, there were increasing violence uh, in the Jala province. Uh, you know, uh, for last month, uh, in, in October, uh, the number of violence uh, incidents has up to uh, about 100, uh, 100 11 uh, incidents of violence. Uh, so this year, uh, for this year, uh, up to until now, uh, only on March and uh, uh, October, uh, that we have level of violence that increased. Uh, other months or the less, uh, you know, the level of violence uh, lower than 100. Uh, so this is what we call the, the, the violence of violence incidents uh, on the ground. Uh, that is a consequence of the, uh, uh, the political approach to solve the problem. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, you can see that the level of uh, uh, casualties or, uh, you know, the level of casualties uh, all years uh, has been stabilized. That means, in spite of the fact that uh, we have a variation of the incidence of violence, but the deaths and the uh, injuries uh, of the people uh, uh, as a consequence of the incident of violence have been stabilized. Uh, so, um, so we we still been uh, in the, you know uh, pretty good shape. You know, uh, you know. We, on the one hand, we have uh, some unpredictable situation, but. On the other hand, uh, uh, the, uh, the casualties 
or the, the, the disaster will be uh, limited, you know, uh, to uh, up to a certain levels. So this is a general trend of violence. Uh, that means we have uh, a long way to go to solve the problem, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, I, I just agree with some uh, people who say that you know we are on the right track. You know, I mean, uh, especially the the uh, people from military side uh, say that you know we are on the right track. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, more or less that that is. Uh, that is the case, you know, because because we look at the trend of violence you know, still be stabilized, uh, but we we have to accept that you know the root cause of the problem have yet to solve. You know. uh, so this is a concern that we have uh, so far. So uh, I would like to summarize uh, the trend of violence over years. Uh, uh, we can call it a protracted uh, violence or protracted conflict uh, in the Deep South. Uh, the level of fatalities and casualties tend to be stable. Uh, in uh, uh, 2013, uh, there is an increasing level of uh, hard target attacks uh, compared with the civilian. Uh, hard target attack means the, the attack on the uh, military or armed forces of the government. Uh, uh, only on to, to, uh, 20, uh, 2013, only on that year, that we have a, a higher level of uh, a heart attack uh, than the uh, uh, heart target attack, than the uh, soft target attack. So this is uh, the trend that we have in 2013 only. But in 2014, uh, the level of violence attacks against civilians increases. Uh, but in general, the, uh, the situation uh, remains stable. And in this year, violence situation has been, uh, you know, uh, has become characterized as a higher level of uh, variance. Uh, so I just, I, I just say that, you know, this is unpre still unpredictable. And uh, uh, the positive side of this is that, you know, uh, they exit some kind of, you know, uh, intrinsic forces, you know, in, uh, I said the intrinsic force, that means the internal forces or internal movement on the ground from the local people, from the local uh, civil societies uh, uh, that try to uh, bring about the peace, uh, peace process. Uh, so this is really, really strong uh, movement on the ground. Uh, so I would say that, you know, uh, in uh, we have uh, protracted violence, uh, but we also have some kind of, uh, you know, uh, positive elements uh, that is the peace force or peace element that is moving on uh, so far. Uh, so um, concerning the language, uh, the, uh, the issue about language, uh, in July we have the uh, opinion polls, uh, opinion survey of the local people, you know, uh, uh, Prince of Sokka used the uh, Center for Conflict Study and Cultural Study uh, have uh, conducted the uh, public opinion polls uh, and on, on this July. And we have sampled about 2,000 people, uh, including Buddhist and Muslim. Uh, uh, it's a proportional uh, systematic uh, sample. So uh, this is the, the question that we ask uh, concerning the, the, the language use or domestic language uh, of the local people. You can see that from, from, from uh, this statistic, you know, uh, people who have uh, said that now they, they use uh, Malay language uh, in the sample is about 30% uh, of people. Uh, uh, and the people who, who say that they use Thai language is about uh, 26 uh, use ties, uh, but but this, uh, uh, the proportion of the samples who are Thai uh, Buddhist uh, is about 20. Uh, so this is lovely, you know, uh, the same uh, proportion of the uh, number of people who are Buddhist uh, in the in the local areas. Uh, but you know, people who say that they they use Thai uh, in household. Uh, uh, it's about 26, you know. But uh, this is an interesting trend. We, 
people will say that they use both Malay and Thai in the households or of uh, domestic language about uh, uh, 30 something, you know, about 30 something. Uh, sorry, uh, I have to with my eyesight. Uh, 30, uh, 34, about 34. Um, so this is the, the issue that we, we, we raise uh, in the local communities in, in, in many uh, local debates about the language uses uh, in the regions. Uh, people, um, most people still use Malay as a domestic language. And at the same time, uh, uh, more and more people use uh, bilingual. That means they use both Thai and Malay uh, in daily life. Uh, uh, and, and this is a trend that, that is uh, increasing. Uh, the number of people who use both Thai and Malay uh, increasing. And when we ask them about the, uh, uh, the language use, uh, each person to evaluate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the language skills in different languages. You can see that, that from, from these uh, uh, graphs that, you know, most people say that they can use Thai, uh, speaking Thai, reading Thai, and speaking Thai, and writing Thai, you know, uh, about 80% of people, you know. And about 50% of people say that they uh, can uh, speak Thai, uh, speak Malay, uh, uh, use Malay language in daily life, uh, uh, speaking Malay, uh, reading Malay, writing Malay. Uh, the Malay now, uh, it means uh, local Malay or Jawi. So uh, I think uh, the majority of people uh, have uh, better Thai language skill. Uh, uh, they, or at least they evaluate themselves, you know, that, that they have a better Thai language skill, reading, writing, speaking, you know. Uh, that is the consequence of the assimilation policy of the government over, I would say, over 100 years. Uh, uh, since 1909, uh, uh, and they suffer from this policy, uh, and they've been under suffer situation from this policy. Uh, but at the same time, they adjust themselves to the Thai language, uh, uh, adjust a lot. Uh, 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 but they still keep their own, you know, uh, local uh, language skill. Uh, so more than half of them believe that they have a better skill of the you know, Malay or Javi language. Uh, so this is interesting trend that we have so far. Uh, that means uh, uh, in the local, among the local populations, uh, I think that uh, most of them, uh, if you ask that, you know, what, which, which language that you prefer to use in your daily life, many of you will say that uh, Malay. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, they can speak Thai, they can use Thai. Uh, so the situation is like, you know, you, you have both Thai and Malay language skills uh, at the same time. Uh, so uh, the trend of the uh, uh, bilingualism in the Deep South region is, uh, is evident uh, to me. So this is from empirical studies. Uh, I, I think that that's an answer that I will have a better uh, analysis than me because I'm not a uh, linguist. Uh, but so this is uh, just uh, to show you the general trend of the you know, situation on the crowd concerning language. So, uh, so I would like to finish my presentation now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kapitan Season Popa. In fact, we could digest uh, your last chart on the languages uh, with a lot more time. Uh, let us move to, to Matt Wheeler, and I'll come back to you, Atan. Uh, Matt, perhaps uh, we have a peace process, dialogue, peace talks. Um, the violence has been stable, but on a slow burn, as uh, Jansi Zampop has mentioned. What do you see from the, the ICT perspective on the ground? <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Ajahn Titinan. Uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers and sponsors um, for the opportunity to talk today. As I understand it, my, my role is to, to try to provide some, some context and some background on the conflict to, to inform uh, the discussion about language policy, um, which is something that, regrettably, I don't know very much about. <clears throat> Um, so my comments are going to be uh, really in two parts. It's a bit disjointed, but I want to look at some history um, and background of the conflict and then uh, review uh, what's been going on more or less uh, in the last couple of years, and especially since the coup, focusing on the dialogue efforts. So it's a good time, I think, to be looking at the conflict. Uh, it's, some, it's a conflict in which things don't appear to change very much. Um, there's this grinding routine of violence which has been going on for more than a decade. Uh, but in fact, things have changed. The dialogue process is part of it. Um, and also, more recently, we've seen uh, the public face of BRN, uh, which is something that I think people who've been watching the conflict have been waiting for for a long time. So that's a, certainly a new development and I think a welcome, a welcome one. I think it's also a good time to look at the conflict because it was a year ago yesterday that uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Defense Minister Pruitt Wong Suan said, we will attempt to solve the problem in the Deep South in one year. Um, and it wasn't long after that that uh, Prime Minister Pruitt said, yes, we're going to try to solve it by the end of next year, meaning this year, uh, in preparation for the ASEAN economic community. Um, it's not looking good. All right, let's take a look at the map. I mean, I think this is familiar to most of you, but when we talk about the Deep South, we're talking about the three southernmost provinces of uh, Patani, Yala, and Narati Wat. Uh, and the conflict zone also includes the four southeastern districts of Songkla province, which are Chanat, Natui, Sabayoy, and Hepa. So this is an area about the size of Lebanon. Uh, there's about two million Thai citizens who live there. Uh, roughly 80% uh, percent are Malay Muslim. They are people who speak the Malay dialect uh, as their first language uh, and who profess Islam. Most of the rest are Thai and Sino-Thai Buddhists. Until a couple of years ago, uh, all of the violence was really confined to this area. Uh, in the last couple of years, um, militants have staged a few operations well outside of this, uh, of this conflict area, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So what's the conflict about? I think in most basic terms, it arises from the fact that the Malay Muslims, although they're a majority in the southernmost provinces, are a minority in Thailand. And they're a minority ethnically, religiously, and linguistically. And they have not been fully integrated into the Thai nation state like many other uh, ethnic and linguistic minorities in Thailand. So uh, while we're on the topic of linguistic minorities, I couldn't resist uh, including this slide. I took this from Isan Record. Uh, and here they're citing a publication called Ethnologue, which uh, is a catalog of world languages. And it has this finding, which I think is just really staggering. 66.67% uh, of Thai speakers speak Thai as a second language. This is the highest percentage of any major language. So this means, more likely than not, most Thai citizens are speaking a language other than Central Thai at home. I may be a bit wrong about that, given uh, the, the, the figures we've seen about Thai Malays who speak Thai at home. But in any way, it's, it's, a, it's a striking uh, statistic. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that there are 74 living languages spoken in Thailand. And I think it just goes to show the extent to which the idea of Thailand as a homogenous society ethnically and linguistically has had to be constructed and propagated with a great deal of effort. But uh, turning back uh, to the southern conflict, from the Malay uh, Muslim perspective, it's possible to think of the problem as one of colonialism. The area that now comprises southernmost Thailand came under direct Siamese administration only uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it, it really started in 1902 when Bangkok annexed the region which was largely a reaction to growing British influence in the Malay Peninsula. So Bangkok sent Siamese Buddhist officials to directly administer the region for the first time. So and this, was, uh, this was accomplished through the extension of the Te Sapiban system uh, under Prince Damrong. Uh, it started in the final decade of the 19th century and was formalized at the beginning of the 20th century. 
but it's essentially the same the same system of provinces and districts with officials sent down from Bangkok that we have today. It's changed very little. So here in this slide we see Monton Patani, which was established in 1906. Monton is a collection of provinces, uh, a circle of provinces, uh, and it was abolished in 1932, which was the same year, of course, that uh, the uh, absolute monarchy came to an end. So the periodic unrest uh, and violence uh, since Patani's ex annexation is a result first and foremost of policies of assimilation. This is not surprising. It's an effort on the part of Bangkok to turn Malay Muslims into Thais. So the conflict is really fueled by a clash between an official conception of Thai identity and a distinct Patani Malay identity bound up with uh, Islam and the Malay language. So uh, official Thai identity, of course, is bound up with Buddhism uh, and uh, central Thai language. Uh, and this informs all aspects of the bureaucracy and also state rituals. This is uh, Thai nationalism, which is embodied in the slogan, nation, religion, and monarchy. And this, much like the administration that Bangkok imposed uh, on the outer regions of Siam, is adapted from Great Britain. Uh, this is a conception of identity that doesn't necessarily resonate among Malay Muslims. Uh, in this slide, we see a poster explaining one of the several state decrees that were issued in the late 1930s and early 40s under Field Marshal Pipun Songkram in the early stages of Thai nation building. So these were decrees on what Thais, if they were to be good citizens, uh, should do and what they should wear. And these decrees did not sit well with uh, Malay Muslims. Uh, they were forbidden from speaking Malay, from wearing traditional dress, etc. Now, to be fair, uh, these uh, decrees were uh, enforced unevenly, uh, but I think it set the tone for relations between the Thai state and the Malay Muslim community. Uh, also, assimilation policies have focused quite strongly on uh, Islamic education, uh, and especially the traditional Islamic schools known in the region as Pondok. For Malay Muslims, Pondok are the means by which the Malay identity and culture and values are preserved and transmitted from one generation to the next. So efforts by the Thai government to interfere uh, with the Pondok are often interpreted as uh, an assault on their communal identity. From Bangkok's perspective, though, it's this separate, explicitly non-Thai identity, which is seen as a threat to territorial integrity and also to national security. Uh, one early example of this dynamic of Malay Muslim disaffection with Thai rule and also uh, resulting Thai insecurity uh, is uh, the case of Haji Sulong, who was uh, chairman of the Patani Provincial Islamic Committee. Uh, his name is always associated with seven demands. Uh, in fact, these were drafted by a group of people in response to a committee of inquiry uh, that was dispatched from Bangkok to look at problems in the Deep South. Uh, and this was in 1947. Uh, based on these demands, um, Haji Sulong led a petition campaign uh, for autonomy, implementation of Islamic law, and also language rights. And we can see uh, the third and fourth of the demands focus on uh, language issues, that Malay and Thai be official languages, and that Malay function as a medium of instruction in primary schools. Um, the cabinet at the time, under Prime Minister Dumrong, actually looked at these seven demands and decided that they were unacceptable. Uh, the degree of autonomy uh, that was implied in these demands was uh, uh, tantamount to dividing the country and therefore uh, unacceptable, not permitted. Uh, as for Haji Sulong, of course, he was uh, accused of rebellion. Uh, that case was dismissed, but he was jailed for defaming the Thai state for several years. In 1954, uh, he and his oldest son, uh, Ahmad Domina, disappeared after reporting to Special Branch Police in Songkla. So, um, the efforts by the Thai state beginning uh, in the 1960s to enforce secular education and to limit uh, the teaching of Malay language really caused a great deal of anger and resentment. For many Malay Muslims, uh, as Sarin Pitsawan has said, national integration meant cultural disintegration. So the state was to be avoided if possible and resisted if necessary. Uh, beginning in the 1960s, resistance took the form of underground separatist fronts. Among the most prominent was Barisan Revolusi Nacional, the National Revolutionary Front, or BRN, which was founded in 1960. 
Uh, at the time, they took their cues uh, from Sukarno in Indonesia. They embraced pan-Malay aims uh, and also socialism, and their leadership went underground in 1968. That's the same year that the Patani United Liberation Organization was founded by a Patani student in India named Biro Kotanila, and he's pictured here. And Pulo really was the most prominent of the separatist groups in the 1970s. Uh, they had a head office in Saudi Arabia. They sent fighters uh, to be trained in Libya and Syria. Um, and throughout the 1970s and 80s, uh, these groups and others mounted a sort of low-level guerrilla war, sometimes staging terrorist attacks in Bangkok. Um, and they really followed the fashion of national liberation movements of the time. By the 1990s, uh, the violence was really at a nuisance level, however, and that was a result of uh, some changing uh, policies of the Thai government, um, a greater degree of democracy. There were a lot of factors involved, but the fact is the violence never disappeared. Uh, we think of the current phase of violence as having begun in 2004. In fact, it can probably be traced to the end of 2001. Uh, there were several arms raids in 2002 and 2003, and then of course in 2004, uh, it, uh, the level of violence just exploded. Uh, it uh, uh, became uh, much more intense. And I'm not going to try to recapitulate uh, the last 12 years of conflict. Uh, I think we got a sense of, of where it stood or where it stands uh, from Ajahn C. Sampop's uh, presentation. Um, but we, we see these kinds of attacks, IED attacks against security forces. I think uh, civilians still account for uh, most of the, the fatalities so far. I believe it's uh, roughly 60 percent. Uh, so it's really civilians who are bearing the brunt of, of the conflict. Um, the response to uh, the, the, the problem in the South is now unfolded under seven administrations. Uh, generally, the response has been pretty conservative. Um, uh, it's been pretty militarized at the same time. Uh, and the problem is, is usually conceived from, from Bangkok's perspective as a lack of economic development and also a lack of justice. Uh, so not really conceived of in terms of identity. So uh, just to move along, uh, under the Pua Thai government, there was a significant change in, in the approach to uh, the Deep South, and that was the inauguration of, uh, uh, of an official peace dialogue process. Uh, it was inaugurated um, on the 28th of February, 2013, and in this slide we see uh, the National Security Council Chief, uh, Lieutenant General Paradon, uh, shaking hands with Hassan Taib, who was described at the time as a liaison for BRN. So there were a lot of problems with this process. It was, uh, there, there were um, a lot of skepticism about it. Uh, we can see that in, in this slide, a cartoon by Zia from Tyrat. Uh, so here we have the, 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 the bus of uh, dialogue and it's heading toward uh, 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 an IED. So the idea is that it's a trap. Um, and um, this was uh, a popular perception, I think, at the time that uh, that there was a lot to lose and maybe not so much to gain uh, from, from this process. Uh, in any case, um, in April 2013, Hassan Taib and another BRN leader posted a video in which they uh, uh, issued five demands. Uh, recognition of BRN as a representative of the uh, Patani Malay people. Uh, Malaysia should be a facilitator, uh, not the mediator. There should be international observation of the talks by the OIC, ASEAN, and NGOs. The fourth one is that the rights of the Malay Patani community need to be recognized by the Thai government. And the fifth one concerned release of prisoners. Uh, the Thais asked for an elucidation uh, of these demands. Uh, and it's interesting because it took a while, but uh, the, the elucidation took the form of of uh, couching each of the demands uh, with reference to provisions of the 2007 Constitution. Uh, and it took a long time for the Thai side to, uh, to examine these demands and to determine if they could serve as a basis for further talks. And in the end, uh, the decision was, yes, they could be. They did not contravene the Constitution. And even the fourth one, which was a little bit dicey, they said, look, we can, we can put that on hold, but we can talk about it later after we've developed more trust. Um, but of course, uh, politics intervened. Um, 
uh, I mean, the, the process was already sort of on the rocks. There was, there was division within the militant camp about uh, whether or not to participate. Uh, but it really was the, the, uh, the politics in, in Bangkok that, uh, that buried this, this process. On the 1st of December, Hassan Taib appeared in a video posted on YouTube. He struck a, a quite strident tone and referred to himself as a former delegate. Uh, and he said that uh, BRN would only resume negotiations after the Siamese parliament acknowledged uh, and implemented the five demands and the prime minister declared uh, dialogue a national priority. Um, this is a picture of a bombing that took place uh, in July, I beg your pardon, December 2013 in Sadao. So this was the first a vehicle-borne IED attack outside of the traditional conflict zone. Sadao is a district in Songkla, it borders Malaysia, but it's, uh, it's to the west of the traditional conflict zone. Uh, and actually this attack involved uh, a car bomb and a couple of motorcycle bombs in different areas of Sadao. Uh, on the same day, they discovered in Phuket uh, an IED concealed in this pickup truck. Uh, this was uh, parked at the P Phuket City Police Station. Uh, it, was a, it was a big bomb, and you can see in the lower picture, uh, they took it uh, to a remote area before they def diffused it. Um, it, it uh, it's not clear if it, if it was designed not to go off or if it just simply failed to go off, uh, but if it had, it really would have changed the complexion of, of the, uh, the conflict. Um, moving on. Ah. Yes, so uh, going back to the to the five demands and the way that they were couched in reference to the 2007 constitution, we can see that now it's kind of quaint uh, because constitutions in Thailand, of course, they're ephemeral. They only last as long as the army chooses. And in this case, uh, that was until the end of May 2014 when they demonstrated uh, for a second time uh, in just the past decade that the army has a veto over the constitutions. Now, somewhat surprisingly, the NCPO said it would pursue dialogue with Malay Muslim militants. Uh, I think this indicates that the dialogue is not just a matter of uh, words in the national security policy, but it's a policy that even this government couldn't be seen to abandon. On the other hand, though, uh, General Prayut is firmly against any sort of special administrative arrangements. He made that abundantly clear during the Yingluck uh, government when he was the army chief. Uh, he's made it clear since then. Uh, his sense is that the, the special administrative zones that we have in Bangkok and in uh, Pattaya are for economic reasons, they're for tourism, not for the situation that we have in the Deep South. In fact, the whole ethos of the NCPO is a, about centralizing power and emphasizing Thai identity and Thai unity. So uh, their approach can also be encapsulated, I think, in their choice of words. Um, Santipap, that was what they called the dialogue process under the Yingluck government, Pukui Santipap, uh, peace dialogue. Uh, in the beginning or middle of 2014, the NCPO started using the word Santisuk. Uh, and Santisuk, uh, it encapsulates the idea of happiness, well-being, and tranquility. So it's, it's sort of a bit of returning happiness to the people, sort of uh, seeping into their approach to the South, but it also is a way of minimizing the conflict because from their perspective, they're not at war. They don't face an enemy. What they face is some misguided individuals, some misunderstanding that needs to be cleared up. It's a way of minimizing the significance of, of the, the problem. But they did say they would continue with dialogue. And on December 1st, uh, Prime Minister Prayut went to Malaysia to speak to his counterpart. Uh, Prime Minister Najib about, uh, about uh, future steps, and they came away with three principles for the dialogue process. One, there should be a period uh, without violence to proceed official talks. The dialogue must include all militant groups. And finally, all of the demands of all of the groups need to be aggregated and presented to the Thai side. Uh, this these, this, this uh, banner in this slide was one of uh, dozens that were discovered on the, um, it says 11 November, it should say 30 November. So it was the day before um, uh, Prime Minister Prayut went to Malaysia. And it makes very clear that 
these hardliners do not believe the ties are sincere about the process. And this has been repeated again and again. It really um, uh, crystallizes their point of view. Uh, they did find counterparts in Mara Patani, uh, a group that was formed originally in October 2014, but sort of reformed with some more members in March 2015. So it includes um, BIPP, GMIP, these are older groups. Uh, there are three factions of Pulo, I think two are actually involved. And they also have representation from BRN, although it's clear that there's a pro-talks faction of BRN, and then there's uh, a hardline faction that is not on board with the talks. Uh, just moving chronologically, we come now to another uh, out-of-area attack. Uh, this was on 10th April uh, 2015. The car bomb exploded in the garage of Central Festival in Gossamui. Uh Six people were injured, um, and this was the first uh, vehicle-borne IED attack outside of the four southernmost provinces. Um, the authorities at the time suggested that this may be domestic politics, but all of the suspects were Malay Muslims. One of them was actually killed in a shootout in Patani, so uh, it's pretty clear that this was arranged by um, Malay Muslim militants. Uh, in August, uh, there were talks between the Thai delegation and Mara Patani, uh, and on the 27th of August, Mara Patani actually had a press conference. Um, they set out three demands of their own. Uh, the first is that the Thai government make the Deep South a priority on the national agenda. And I think uh, the coup uh, illustrates the, the rationality of, of this demand. Um, they need some continuity. Uh, second, the uh, Thai government must recognize Mara Patani as a legitimate organization. And third, uh, Mara Patani representatives need to be given immunity and safe passage in Thailand. This is a very important demand from their perspective. So uh, on the 7th of September, a uh, six-minute video was uploaded onto YouTube, and we have Abdul Karim Khalib, uh, who described himself as spokesman for the information department of BRN. Uh, and his declaration said that independence remains BRN's highest objective. Um, he also uh, cited the UN General Assembly Resolution 1514. Uh, to say that uh, this, this is what uh, guarantees the Malay people their right to self-determination. And of course, as you can see in the slide, he mentions one language, one nation. Um, and again, also emphasize the point that BRN doesn't trust uh, the ties. Uh, the next instance we have of BRN um, uh, opening uh, to the world is uh, the interview they did with uh, a journalist based in Bangkok, uh, Anthony Davis. Uh, and the two articles were produced from this one in the Bangkok Post and then this one. So they're very clear that uh, they're not involved in the Mara Patani process uh, and that what they really need in order to become involved is international participation. Why? Because they don't trust the ties. And then uh, on the 12th of October, we get this four page uh, statement issued by BRN. They also emphasize in this statement that uh, they need uh, international mediators. Uh, and there's also, uh, again, mention of the UNGA Resolution 1514. That's the Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples. So I think this shows an effort to show that they're working within international norms, that they can be players on the international stage. Uh, but unfortunately, this um, resolution has really been interpreted as self-determination for decolonized states rather than for ethnic minorities uh, within states. So the Thai response to uh, these BRN statements has been pretty subdued. They say it won't have any effect on the ongoing process. Um, uh, Mara Patani has said essentially the same thing, that you know disputes within groups are natural, but it shouldn't impact on the, um, on the process. So this is where things are right now. Uh, the process is still alive, but it's not apparent how it's going to be productive, at least in the near term, when we have the army that's uh, dead set against any sort of devolution of power, uh, and we have BRN hardliners who have not bought in. Uh, I know I'm, I'm probably running a, a bit long, you know, really long, okay. I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to bring uh, th this slide up, because I think it's important uh, I think it's, it, it illustrates the, the way that identity is really rejected by, you know, powerful, um, you know, quarters in Thailand. 
So this is uh, Privy Council President Bremden Tulanon. He was talking uh, in the South at his foundation, uh, and you know he says there's there's misunderstanding about the idea that there are divisions or class divisions between these two groups of people, uh, ties um, and uh, Buddhist ties and Muslim ties. Two things can help alleviate the problem, namely tieness, meaning the feeling of being Thai, having been born here. One must have a feeling of gratitude to the country and loyalty to the monarchy and justice, justice being the second thing. Uh, and to me, this really um, uh, is uh, indicative of, uh, of, a, of a hurdle that needs to be overcome in approaching um, the, the conflict in the South. And it brings to mind uh, an anecdote uh, of several years ago when I was talking uh, to a Malay Muslim man. He was from Banang Sata, a real hotbed of insurgency in Yala. Not an insurgent, as far as I know. And he said, look, I, I'm Thai. I have a Thai ID card. I can sing the Thai national anthem. I speak Thai. Uh, I speak Thai very well. I have no problem being Thai, but they need to understand that I am Malay Upatani. All right? And then a few days later, I was in Nakhon Si Tamarat, which is where the headquarters of the 4th Army region is. I was talking to a retired general, and he said, look, Malay Muslims, they can practice their religion. There's no interference in their, their religious practice whatsoever. You know, they just need to understand that they're Thai. So you know, this, to me, is the crux of the problem. Thank you. <laughs>